This is my lawn. I mow it, water it, pull weeds, and occasionally enjoy it. It's not the greatest lawn in the world, but it's pretty typical. Everybody on my block has one. In fact, pretty much every house in this town has a lawn. But what insidious force compels me to expend so much energy on this measly plot of grass? Why not let it grow to its full potential? What's wrong with a few dandelions? Why do I need a nice lawn at all? Well, like most things, I can pin the blame squarely on medieval aristocracy. But first, let's talk about angiosperms. Angiosperms rule the earth. They've been around since the dinosaurs, and today they occupy over 90% of the planet's land surface. Angiosperms are flowering plants. This covers most of the plant species on the planet, including all flowers, fruiting plants, deciduous trees, and yes, grasses. Grass itself covers over 40% of the Earth's surface. No wonder it is by far the most common plant used in our lawns. In the United States, lawns take up more acreage than the top eight crops combined. But it wasn't always like this. We didn't really even start having lawns until the 19th century, and it didn't really take off until after World War II. Before that, Lawns were mostly limited to the wealthy upper classes of medieval Europe. They were the only segment of society that could afford to set aside and maintain land that didn't produce food or contribute to their livelihood in any way. Maintaining a lawn was hard work back then. The grass had to be cut by hand using a scythe or shears. And you know the landed elite weren't going to be rolling up their ruffled sleeves and getting their cravats dirty, scything their own lawn. They didn't have to. They paid people to do it for them. So a lawn was not only a lot of work, it was expensive. That is, until the invention of the lawnmower in 1830. The mechanization of lawn care made it possible for those besides the extremely rich to maintain their lawns. An aspiring lawn owner need only the time to tend it. But before 1938, many workers in the U.S. had to work more than eight hours a day during the week and half days on Saturdays. That left little time to take care of a lawn. But in 1938, Congress mandated the 40-hour work week. This freed up workers' time so that they could conceivably manage a lawn. But the lawn's greatest ally was yet to come, the suburb. While suburbs appeared around most major cities in the U.S. at the turn of the 20th century, they didn't really take off until after World War II. The influx of war veterans seeking homes increased the demand for cheap and plentiful housing. The GI Bill made it possible for these returning soldiers to buy homes at discounted rates. Cheap, mass-produced housing began expanding all throughout the United States, thanks to William Jared Levitt. By circumventing unions, cutting out middlemen, and turning the construction of a home into 27 systematic steps, Levitt created what was essentially the first assembly line for large-scale, low-cost housing. Soon, these Levitt-style housing developments were popping up all over the United States, each one ordained with a pristine plot of well-manicured grass. Now everybody could have a nice, big lawn. Well, not really. Levitt was super racist and restricted the sale of his homes to white Americans. Sales agents were explicitly instructed not to accept any applications from African Americans, even if they were war veterans. So not everybody got a nice big lawn. But these suburbs began to represent the American dream, where anyone with a can-do spirit and a hardworking attitude and the right complexion could obtain their own piece of land with their very own prefabricated home complete with 2.5 kids and an immaculate lawn. Soon the condition of the lawn became synonymous with the caliber of the homeowner's character. A well-maintained lawn meant a well-run, hard-working household, populated by true Americans who work 40 hours during the week but don't spend their weekends in idleness. No, they have a lawn to take care of. It needs to be mowed and watered. Unwelcome plant varieties need to be removed to make room for a perfectly uniform mat of green grass. An overgrown, neglected lawn reflected laziness on the part of the homeowner, even a decrepitude of moral fiber. Because if you're not maintaining your lawn to the same standards as your neighbors, you must be some kind of social deviant. Just as Levitt was enforcing a monoculture within his suburbs, the homeowners were cultivating a monoculture of plants in their lawns. And having a nice big lawn is more than just a symbolic act. Many communities across the U.S. actively police the upkeep of their neighborhood's lawns. Homeowners can be subject to a fine if their grass isn't clipped short enough, or if their yard doesn't adhere to the community's standards of lawn care. Anyway, it's all pretty insane when you think about it. But humans are weird, especially Americans. But that's how the American lawn came to be what it is today. 
and our national obsession with lawns is putting a real strain on the environment. We apply more synthetic fertilizers and pesticides to our lawns than an equivalent area of cropland. This not only can hurt the local wildlife, but these chemicals can end up in our drinking water. The manufacture and use of these chemicals require large amounts of fossil fuels and contributes to global warming. Lawnmowers and landscaping equipment account for 10 to 18% of non-transportation related gasoline emissions. Running a single lawnmower for an hour emits just as much pollution as 40 automobiles. In a year, a hectare of lawn can contribute as many greenhouse gases as a jet flying halfway around the world. Not to mention that an estimated 17 million gallons of gasoline are spilled every summer while refueling those lawn mowers. That's almost two Exxon Valdez scale oil spills every year, right in our front yard. But most crucially, lawns require a lot of water. 50 to 70% of all residential water in the United States goes to landscaping. Irrigated lawns take up nearly three times as much space as irrigated corn. To maintain that amount of grass on a daily basis, nine billion gallons of water need to be allocated to our lawns. That's like every person in the United States dumping 30 gallons of fresh, drinkable water onto the ground every single day. But our lawns don't have to be this much of a drain on the environment. For one thing, we can reduce the amount of fertilizers and pesticides we use just by changing up the plants in our lawn. It doesn't have to be a uniform mat of grass. Low maintenance shrubs, herbs, or perennials can take the place of grass and increase the biodiversity of your lawn. Certain kinds of plants can reduce the amount of time needed for mowing and increase the natural carbon sequestration abilities of our lawns. After all, grasslands are one of the great carbon sinks on the planet. Properly maintained, a lawn can actually help fight climate change while still providing an area for barbecues and bocce ball. We need only change what it means to have a nice big lawn. Because truly, an environmentally sustainable lawn would be a better measure of our moral fiber as citizens of planet Earth than any of those old lawns ever were. Special thanks to our Patreon subscribers. Without them, the good stuff just wouldn't happen. So if you want the show to continue happening, become a Patreon supporter. We've got a lot of great perks. You get access to our live stream. There's a soundtrack you can get and you get early access to these videos and a podcast that we do. It's pretty funny, you should check it out. So if you really want the good stuff to keep on happening, become a supporter on Patreon. And thanks for watching.